Welcome to this episode of Clear Talk. Today, I'm joined by Bradford Dempsey, CEO of Solutions 360, to talk about the practice of collecting deposits on our integration projects and how that can impact our cash flow positively for our business. So welcome today, Brad. Thanks for having me, Joel. So we know that in the construction business, often a fair amount of our uh, companies try to invoice on progress. And let's talk a little bit about what opportunity they're missing by not collecting deposits in advance of that actual performance of work. Well, I think the biggest thing I see is that there are a lot of integration firms that don't even try to ask for deposits because they have that mindset that I'm doing AIA billing or I'm dealing with GCs that you know simply historically have, have never allowed it. But business is very much managing things at a portfolio level. I know we've had this conversation many times. And if I can get deposits on 10% of my business, you know, that's a fairly small amount of my business, but even if I can get 10% of my customers to give me deposits, what does that mean to my cash flow? How will, how will that help me? And then if I start to condition my salespeople to build in, or, or maybe as a company, we build in different proposals and different formats that lay out a 40, 40, 20 type of payment arrangement, you know, 40% down, 40% substantial completion, 20% at final acceptance. We, if only some of those are accepted by the customers, we're way ahead of the game and we're, we're not really losing anything by providing those options. I think that's, that's a really important point for integrators to think about. That's a great point. And then that leads us to the discussion of if I'm recognizing revenue on invoicing, which you and I know is not the correct gap methodology, uh, how do I think about uh, deposits, invoicing, and revenue recognition? And what, are the, what do those, each of those terms mean? And maybe how do they work within Solutions 360 software? Um, I think the most important point to understand is that you need to decouple your invoicing from your revenue recognition. Invoicing should not drive revenue recognition. Invoicing should be done whenever it's possible to do with your customer based upon your contractual obligations or um, any milestones. So, and you need a system, whether it's Q360 or anything else that allows you to do that kind of invoicing. Now, when you invoice something that you haven't recognized, that is a liability. Well, that may sound like a bad thing, but the other side of a liability is an asset, and that asset is cash in the bank. So yes, you do owe some work, but you're going to owe the work anyways. Now it's just on your balance sheet, but you have cash to offset that. So when we're talking about this cycle, it, number one, decouple invoicing from revenue recognition. You should be able to invoice anything you want, anytime you want within your system and find a way to do that to be able to truly um, enhance your cash flow. Thank you. One of the things that I've found resonates with our integrator community is when they, when they recognize that they don't want, they're not in the business and they don't want to be in the business of being the bank for their customers, right? But when we think about only collecting after we perform the work, we can't help but be the bank because we have to fund all the equipment, we have to fund all the labor, and then we have to get paid sometimes under an AIA construction of a pay when paid construct, which is just a killer on the cash flow. So what you're suggesting is that when I'm not in an AIA situation, which is a fair amount of our business where we're doing direct customer um, uh, contracts, we can then work on collecting a deposit, which allows us to front the payment and begin to reverse that cash cycle. So that is an amazing tip for our integrators. Talk a little bit about, if you would, about different billing method models. You mentioned a 40, 40, 20. Uh, how does that, and then maybe talk a little bit about how that applies to projects, service contracts, or other types of, of work that we do as, as part of our systems integration business. Sure. Um, 40, 40, 20 is just a typical example. You may not be able to get a 40% deposit up front, but whether you structure it so you can get a 10% deposit, maybe even a 5% deposit, anything you can do to structure out that payment plan is going to help your cash flow. Now, when we're talking about service contracts or um, uh, agreements, software agreements, that sort of thing, you want to set your billing up in such a way that if I'm covering the period from January 1st to January 31st, 
I would normally send out my invoice on December 1st of the previous year. So I'm invoicing 30 days in advance for a coverage period that is in the future. Now that is deferred revenue, but again, that gives me the cash flow before I am actually obligated to provide that service, assuming I can get paid within those 30 days as well. Um, even with TNM type work, you know, inspections, you know, there, there's a concept of, of block billing um, where you give the customer an option to say, you can buy X number of hours of labor up front or a certain number of inspections and you pay me for those and I'll give you a better deal. You know, um, very much like you see, everybody's seen this when they're buying software or certain things online, you can pay us X number of dollars a month, or if you pay the annual amount right now, we'll give you a break and you'll pay a little less if you pay the annual amount. Wherever you can do that, you're going to improve your cash flow and you're going to help bank and support your own business from a cash perspective. And from a customer perspective, I mean, there's one rule that I've followed since the 90s, maybe not so much in the 80s, and that is take all the discounts you can up front because I'm going to pay less and so on uh, than the interest rate. But from an integrator perspective, even if I'm discounting greater than the interest rate, which would be practically non-existent, the guarantee of payment and the having those funds in the bank well offset kind of the cost of, of money. Would, would, would you agree with that? Or should, should we think about it more of a cost of money equation? No, I think that's an, a very, very valuable point. It costs a lot of money to have somebody go through your aged receivables, right? phone calls, send out emails, uh, you know, work to try and collect that money. That, it takes a lot of effort to do that. And anything you can do to reduce that labor, that downstream labor, is going to be a benefit. Now let's move to the idea that 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 someone's listening to this and they say, this is great. I'm going to apply that. What is the type of task that you should do, especially if you're working within Solutions 360, that allow you then to plan your 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 cash forecast with the idea that you're going to be collecting deposits? Well, I think the biggest thing that is new to people who are in uh, using Q360 is this concept of setting up actual tasks in a project, which are invoicing tasks. And a lot of times they get really um, tied up on the idea that they're putting a date on an invoice in the future. What you have to realize is what we're doing is we're just planning when we believe we're going to invoice. It doesn't mean we have to invoice then. What it is, is the ability to say, if all things in the project work out, then we're going to invoice this amount at this date. And then we know on average how fast that customer pays us. So then we get a very good idea of when we're actually going to have that money in the bank. So now we have the ability to predict when we're going to get that money. Now, what happens when the project shifts? Because it always happens. Well, what we do is we shift not only the labor tasks and the material delivery, we shift the invoicing date. So now we have this series of metrics which all move together which allow our forecasts to stay accurate. But if we didn't have those invoicing tasks there to move and to plan with, we wouldn't be able to forecast that accurately. I love how all that works together in providing a 90-day cash forecast, which, as you know, is sadly missing in most of our integration vocabulary of thinking about how do we plan for the success of our business around cash. So today we've covered some great ideas. One is let's collect cash early and not wait on uh, job progress. Let's separate the idea that I have to tie revenue to invoicing and treat those as two separate things. And thirdly, let's schedule those, those tasks out so we can accurately forecast our cash. Thanks so much, Bradford. That's been a great discussion today on how do we advance the cash cycle in our industry. My pleasure. Thank you.